Harvard é um nome quase mítico quando a gente pensa em grandes universidades. E a Harvard Business School é, sem dúvida, uma das escolas de negócios mais famosas do mundo. Está sempre nos rankings dos melhores MBAs e tem tradição. Fundada em 1908, foi a pioneira em usar estudos de caso e muito debate como método de ensino. Pois essa instituição que lança tendências e é uma referência para os concorrentes está nesse momento se reinventando. À frente da transformação, o indiano Nitsin Noria, diretor da Harvard Business School, desde julho de 2010. Ele veio ao Brasil a convite da Fundação Estudar e é com esse formador de líderes o nosso Conta Corrente Especial. So, Mr. Noria, Professor Noria, welcome to our show. You have said in interviews that the 20th century was the American century and this is going to be the global century. You are the first non-North American dean of the Harvard Business School. Uh, eight of your predecessors were born in the U.S., one was Canadian. What does it mean to HBS uh, having a dean from Bombay, India? And what does it mean to you personally uh, being ahead of this institution? So you know, when I came to the United States in 1984, uh, as someone who had traveled outside of India for the first time, if someone had told me that one day I would be dean of Harvard Business School, uh, I would never have believed it. <laughs> uh, so for me, this has been a dream come true in many ways. It reflects the great promise of America, a country that has always been welcoming of immigrants and has embraced them and has given them uh, amazing opportunities. Uh, I also feel that uh, as dean of Harvard Business School, uh, now looking forward to the second hundred years of uh, this wonderful institution's history. In some ways, my identity reflects uh, changes that are taking place in the world as well. Uh, as I have uh, said in the past, uh, the 20th century was very much an American century in business. But as we look today, and here I am in Brazil, uh, we are clearly in a very different world, where the world will have many nations that will vie for competitive advantage in, in a world. I think this will be a global century in business. And as someone who is in some ways a global citizen, having been brought up in India, but now having lived in America for most of my adult life, I think I'm well suited to lead this institution into this new century. Yeah, without a doubt. And it's, inter it's interesting because you have a book uh, about insiders and outsiders, how they have shaped American business leadership. Uh, maybe you were once an outsider, but now you're as insider as it gets. Uh, and that brings me to another reflection. You are the first. Uh, a dean to actually live in the dean's house on campus since the 70s. Uh, that was perceived by the Financial Times, for instance, as a sign of your commitment to the Harvard community and as a sign of, uh, uh, that you intend to take the school back to its <coughs> academic roots. Uh, at the same time, uh, you promise radical innovation. People are talking about uh, the reinvention of Harvard Business School. Is there a contradiction? I don't think so. I think that you know, uh, great institutions like Harvard have always this challenge that on the one hand, they have to honor their traditions. What has made us great is that we have extraordinary traditions at the school. Things like the case method that we invented that have become famous that are now used by business schools all across the world, uh, including, uh, I visited uh, yesterday, INSPIR, which is a school in Sao Paulo that has been inspired by uh, the methods that we pioneered. Uh, in fact, all across Latin America, we've had schools that have, been, that have learned from the traditions of our business school. Uh, but great institutions don't remain great unless they're willing to innovate and think about what else they need to do that will create the future of management education. And in that sense, uh, when I became dean, I felt that uh, by moving back to the campus, on the one hand, I wanted to signal uh, that I very much value the time-honored traditions of Harvard Business School, but also that we should not be afraid, uh, even as we honor our traditions, to think about what changes we need to make so that we can remain an extraordinary institution for our next 100 years. Mm -hmm. Among those chains you've named, for instance, Professor Yang Mi Moon as chair Uh, of the school's MBA program, and she's the first woman to uh, hold 
that prestigious post. Uh, Do Moon is considered an exceptional teacher. She doesn't have an MBA herself. Um, is it true that this decision uh, has puzzled some of uh, the HBS uh, old timers? <laughs> so you know, as when you bring in new people who are unfamiliar to a leadership position as important as the head of our MBA program, of course, people pay a lot of attention. Uh, but in a year, young Mi Moon uh, has been able to win over all of the people who at some point may have been puzzled. When we admit our new MBA class, uh, they are going to be welcomed to some fairly significant changes in our MBA program. Uh, on the one hand, they will continue to experience a first year course, which will have the traditional case method, the 10 courses that we have always taught in our first year curriculum. But they will also be introduced to a new initiative that we're introducing called Feud. the field course. Feud, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, we think that the field course is in some ways inspired by the very best traditions of the case method because the case method was an attempt to bring students closer to the world of practice. Rather than teach them theory, we said, we will put you in the shoes of real business leaders, give you a case which represents a real business situation. And by discussing it with 90 other colleagues who may have different views on that same case, you learn how to exercise the judgment of a business leader. Uh, but what we've uh, discovered recently is that, you know, even though students learn a lot in terms of uh, their intellectual knowledge of a circumstance by virtue of the case method, there's still a difference between knowing something and translating it into doing. So what the field method is going to try and do is to put students in small teams where they will be encouraged to, in fact, practice their skills as leaders on a wide variety of problems. And we hope that in this way, we will further advance the preparation of leaders that can go out and make a difference in the world. So we're very excited about this new innovation. And frankly, young Mi Moon has been one of the great architects of this. So uh, as she has been making progress and showing her imagination in this work, a lot of people are excited about what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You've established five I's, five priorities, uh, innovation, intellectual ambition, internationalization, inclusion, integration, am I right? So uh, about the internationalization, I think you are having more and more international students, correct me if I'm, a, if I'm wrong, and more than that, um, you said you want to have more uh, international research centers, can we expect like international learning centers, maybe uh, uh, Harvard Business School centers in Brazil? So we already are now have a permanent uh, case writer that is based uh, in Sao Paulo. And we have been over the last several years doing more and more research in Brazil. So the number of cases, if you looked 10 years ago and you asked yourself how many cases had Harvard Business School written in, in Brazil, the answer would have been close to none. Uh, but in the last decade, we have written more than 30 cases uh, in Brazil. And every year we have more of our colleagues coming and doing research in Brazil. But we're also going to bring our students to Brazil as part of the field course. Uh, one of the modules of the field course is to encourage all our students to go to an emerging market destination, to think, to work with companies, to think about a new product or service that that company might introduce in that market. Uh, this year we'll have about 100 students come to Brazil in, th in this January. Uh, with them will come three faculty members. They will work with more than 15 or 16 companies. Uh, on projects. Uh, so in a wide variety of ways, what we're trying to do is to both bring uh, faculty members and students to Brazil and to other parts of the world. But equally, we want to make sure that we can learn from the great companies and industries that are being formed in Brazil, companies like Natura, mm -hmm. companies like Ambev. I mean, these are extraordinary companies. And bring the lessons from those companies back to our classrooms in Harvard Business School so that even students who don't travel here can benefit from what we learn from the case studies here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've got like 32% of your students are international. Is it a go-to uh, uh, have more candidates, more alumni uh, from abroad, from countries like Brazil and India? And um, in that, for that matter, what's the role of institutions like uh, Fundação Estudar, Estudar Foundation? So we have never tried to set uh, numerical targets for how many percentage of any group of people we have. We have always admitted people as a true meritocracy. So as we find that there are more qualified students that are developing in different parts of the world, uh, we begin to see far more attractive and promising students who can compete with students who went to American universities. And we're seeing more and more of that. So for example, uh, a decade ago, we had three or four students from Brazil each year. This year, we'll have more than 15. I think this is a sign of both Brazil's rise, uh, the emergence of better universities here, 
but more importantly, the opportunity for students in their first two or three years to get meaningful work experience. Because students who are admitted to Harvard Business School aren't just admitted because they have great academic qualifications. They usually have three or four years of pretty remarkable work experience. And 15, 20 years ago, that would have been harder to get in Brazil. Today, uh, there are remarkable companies that are giving wonderful opportunities to young students. Uh, and those become then very attractive people for us. So in that way, the proportion of students uh, over the years at Harvard Business School from international locations keeps varying. We used to, for example, 50 years ago, have a lot of students from Europe. Now we have many more students from mainland China. Uh, we used to rarely see students from mainland China. They used to only come from Hong Kong. Uh, we used to see more students from Mexico. Now we see even more students from Brazil. So uh, there's a, you know, as the global economy is a dynamic economy, our students are a pretty dynamic representation of this evolving economy. And places like the Fundação Estudar are really important because they encourage, they provide the financial resources to help students come to a place like Harvard. Sure, of course. And uh, it's interesting because um, business schools in general uh, are now challenged by the economic uncertainty uh, because trust in business itself uh, is at a low point. More than that, American business schools, like you said, are challenged by uh, overseas competition because it's natural. I mean, uh, there is economic growth uh, yeah. in India and Brazil, and then we can expect uh, some educational improvement, uh, better institutions, better faculties, and so forth. You are aware of the, this double challenge, right? <laughs> no, I think that uh, in some ways it's a very exciting development, just as uh, I have always felt that the nice thing about global competition is that it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. uh, the rise of uh, other nations uh, creates opportunities for everyone. So think about the rise of middle-class consumers in places like China, India, and Brazil. Certainly they provide great opportunities for companies in Brazil, but they also provide great opportunities for companies who can now meet the demand that these consumers have from all over the world. Uh, in the same spirit, I think that as we see the rise of business schools in other parts of the world, and I am very sure that if we looked at a list of the top 50 business schools globally 20 years from now, there will be names on that list that are not on that list today. And these names will come from places like Brazil, they will come from places like India, they will come from places like China. And I think that will be healthier for business schools in general. My challenge at, at Harvard Business School is how do we remain leaders on a mix of institutions that will forever be changing and in a competitive landscape that will be quite different, which is why internationalization is a continuing priority at the school. I believe that our competitive advantage will lie in providing the most global education of any business school. So if you come to a school in China, chances are you learn a lot about China. If you come to school in Brazil, chances are you learn a lot about Brazil. But what I hope we can do at Harvard Business School through our network of research centers around the world is that if you come to Harvard Business School, it may yet be the place where you will learn not just about Brazil, but you will also learn about China, you will also learn about Europe, you will also learn about India, you will also learn about all other parts of the world because we have today the presence that allows us to develop knowledge all across the world. So if we can stay ahead on that, that's where I believe we will continue to be a destination that the best leaders will still come to, even as the competition around us becomes much more global. Depois do intervalo, a gente continua a nossa entrevista com Nitin Noria, diretor da Harvard Business School. Estamos de volta com nossa entrevista com Nitin Noria, que é o diretor da Harvard Business School. So, Mr. Noria, we are living in times of economic uncertainty, and whenever we see the markets nervous, as we've had in the past weeks, I wonder if HBS, Harvard Business School students, are already debating how to create jobs in the U.S., how to restore the confidence uh, in, in stocks, and how to save the euro. Uh, at the end of the day, actually, business uh, or business schools are about uh, teaching leadership and giving the right tools to solve problems. Uh, is, what, is that what business schools are for? So I think that uh, if you look at who creates prosperity in any society, uh, in the end, I think business is the root of creating prosperity in society. Uh, business institutions uh, create jobs. Business institutions create new technologies. Business in institutions are now even increasingly involved in providing in a number of ways important social services, uh, sometimes directly, 
but sometimes because business leaders, uh, often through their generosity, create foundations and NGOs and help support civil society. Because I think good business leaders realize that there is a positive relationship between business and society. That if business creates value for society, society respects business leaders and in turn allows business leaders to create some value for themselves. If this relationship is maintained, then I think business and, and society are in a positive relationship with each other. As we face this economic uncertainty that the world has today, which frankly I think this time has been created more by a failure of political leadership. The last economic crisis in 2008 was probably created more by a failure of business leadership. Uh, I hope that business will continue to play a stabilizing role uh, in making sure that people realize that actually business opportunities worldwide remain strong and that while governments may have uh, overspent and need to think much harder about fiscal responsibility and creating a consensus around that, uh, that business can be a way to help the world get out of the current uncertainty and create a future that we can all feel better about. Mm -hmm. I saw the video, Imagine Leadership, in which uh, you've collaborated, and it's beautiful because it makes one think about the importance of being a leader. Um, even Mother Teresa of Calcutta was a leader. Um, will Harvard Business School uh, be engaged in educating, educating the leaders who will make a better world? I mean, leaders like Mahatma Gandhi may be uh, instead of only uh, uh, greedy uh, <laughs> bankers, which we tend to think of when we think of uh, uh, the classic uh, business school. Yeah, so the mission of Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And as I remind people, uh, it's important that these be experienced as leaders who distinguish themselves, not just by their competence, because we certainly cultivate their competence at Harvard Business School, but also distinguish themselves by their character, that they're known to be people who have integrity, they're known to be people who deeply care about improving the welfare of society. Now, this can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, I think business leaders themselves, directly through business, can create prosperity. But increasingly, we find that as many as 10% of our students are going on and joining the social enterprise sector, uh, organizations like Endeavor, uh, that is here in Brazil. So we have many of our students now beginning to ask the question, how can I take the business skills that I've learned and actually allow not-for-profit organizations, social enterprise organizations to function more effectively to solve social causes? So it's very inspiring to see a new generation of students that care to apply business principles to these fields as well. We're also beginning to see now more and more joint students between the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School. My hope is that these people who may go out into public policy, if they understand business more deeply, understand the relationship between business and government, perhaps they can introduce better social policy, build a better bridge between business and government. So in many ways, I think that Harvard Business School today has the opportunity to educate leaders in all fields of life, uh, all of whom would be benefited by at least bringing the core skills of business to these different spheres of, uh, of human affairs. So in many ways, I agree with you that uh, mm -hmm. Unless we produce leaders that really one can look at and say, you know, they may not be Mahatma Gandhi or they may not be Mother <laughs> Teresa, but at least what they're trying to do in their own way is guided by that same sense of a higher noble purpose. That's when I think that we would have truly lived up to our mission. Yeah, and I, I read your address to the class of 2011 last May, and you said beautiful words about character, ethics, humility. You said, your challenge is to reclaim humility for yourselves and for your generation of leaders. Why is it so important? So I think too many people have begun to think of business leaders as so arrogant that they only care about themselves and they don't care about others. From the vast majority of business leaders that I know, and I grew up in a business family, I know that part of what motivated my father who became CEO of a great Indian company, was his great desire to help the welfare of his country, to advance development in India. That was his goal as much as his goal was to do better for himself or his family. Uh, remembering that, remembering that leadership is a privilege, it is not a right, that when you in fact become a leader, you have even a greater need to be humble because now you have all the power. There is no reason for you to behave arrogantly because already people treat you with so much respect. I think in a moment like that, if people exhibit generosity, if people exhibit humility, then people treat them with even more respect. And if business leaders behave that way, I think that they would earn the right to be 
called by others as leaders rather than just thinking of themselves as leaders. And I think that this message is a very important message that our students need to internalize and take to heart because it will help them as they develop as leaders to enjoy the respect that business leaders really should have. A couple of years ago, we wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review called The Seven Things That Surprise New CEOs. I know many people ask you that in interviews, but I can't resist. So what, when you became the boss, what uh, 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 did surprise you? So I think the one thing that surprised me is that, uh, you know, as an academic, uh, I always spoke freely. That was the nature of being an academic. And now I have learned that when I speak, people pay a lot more attention than they ever <laughs> used to. Uh, so a whisper uh, can sometimes be like a megaphone. Uh, so I have to be a little bit more careful sometimes about what I say. I have tried to still retain my basic sense of uh, being myself and continuing to be authentic. But you do have to be a little bit more careful about how people will interpret uh, what you say. So that's one thing that I used to teach CEOs about. And now, having become dean, I've learned myself. <laughs> The other thing that I've learned is that it is a relentless job. Uh, the number of constituencies that come together are so many now. So I, I not only have to deal with students, I have to deal with staff, I have to deal with faculty members, I have to deal with the university. So the number of constituencies that come together in a job like this uh, expand tenfold relative to anything I was doing in the past which I think is the general experience of anybody who becomes <laughs> a CEO. And you are pretty active uh, in Twitter, Facebook. You get messages from students all over the world. Do you actually read and answer to those messages? I wish I could say that I am able to read and answer every message that comes to me. But I do quite actively update myself on Twitter and Facebook. I at least keep track of what's going on. Uh, if something catches my eye that someone says, then I might respond to it. Uh, but more than that, I'm just trying to make sure that people uh, learn about the amazing things that are constantly happening at Harvard Business School. So my tendency on Twitter has been to try and bring the world some insight about things that my colleagues are writing, events that our students are hosting, the activity that's taking place at Harvard Business School, both on our campus and around the world. Because I'm always amazed by how many people are curious to know what's going on at the school. And in some ways, I just allow my own insight as to what's going on to be something that I can share with others around me. Professor Noria, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you so much, Leila, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be back in Brazil and to have this opportunity. Thank you. E obrigada a vocês também que nos acompanharam nesse Conta Corrente Especial. Até a próxima.